Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mark Fitzgibbons, and uh, I'll be emceeing today. I was a political hermit in Fauquier County until I heard about Martha Bonetta's plight. Today, Virginians reclaim some freedom and property rights. House Bill 1430, the Bonetta Bill, sponsored by Delegate Scott Ligenfelter, amends Virginia's Prop Right to Farm Act, first by making some cl clarifications, then by adding teeth to it so that farmers may protect their rights when counties violate the act. Our speakers today are farmer and best-selling author Joel Salatin, property rights activist Donna Holt, Martha Bonetta, the farmer after whom the bill is named, and of course, Delegate Scott Lingenfelter. Martha Bonetta is the victim of nightmarish bureaucratic actions that include threats of fines of $5,000 per violation for selling her farm goods, advertising pumpkin carvings, and holding a birthday party for her friend's daughter and seven other little girls. Her quaint farm store in Paris, for which she had a business license to operate, is now closed because of the uncertain, unlawful, and unscrupulous enforcement actions by Fauquier County. In 2011, Fauquier County adopted a special administrative permit that restricts farmers to selling their produce and labeling produce from others' farms. It even limits pumpkin patch events. And under that ordinance, farmers technically could not even sell a bottle of water to their visitors. Martha Bonetta already had a business license and understood that this new permit requirement would restrict her rights. Martha rejected the notion that the county could impose new restrictions on her or any farmer. In one hearing in which Martha was charged with violations and threatened with fines, the county zoning administrator had the gall to say that Martha was out of line. Now, some people farm as a hobby, some for a living to pay the mortgage. The Bonetta Bill clarifies that the Right to Farm Act includes the commerce of farming, meaning that farmers have the right to sell their goods and the products resulting from their ingenuity, time, labor, and capital. Farmers want food freedom, not food stamps. The bill also clarifies that a farmer's goods include byproducts such as wool fiber from farm animals, tea from herbs, and crafts that the farmers and the families may make from what they grow with value added. The Bonetta Bill says that farmers may sell items incidental to their produce, such as beverages, food, art, literature, artifacts, and even hand-painted furniture. Farmers have always been self-sustaining people, and the farming lifestyle has never been limited or restricted to just growing crops. There is a 50% cap on incidental so that farms don't become Pier 1 furniture stores, which re respects counties' agricultural zoning. Founder and America's fourth Supreme Court Justice, John Marshall, whose home still stands in Fauquier County, wrote in Marbury versus Madison that the Constitution is our fundamental and paramount law and that laws repugnant to it are void. The Bonetta Bill expressly declares void any county ordinance that violates constitutional rights on farm property. Thus farmers, their families and friends are protected from county intrusions into their peaceable assembly, their religious faiths, and their speech along with other rights under the second, fourth, ninth, and tenth amendments to the Constitution. Provision, provision of uh, House Bill 1430 that puts real teeth into the Right to Farm Act allows farmers to sue counties and county officials who violate the act for the same fines that the counties would impose on farmers plus attorney's fees. I deal with bureaucrats who ignore and violate not only the Constitution, but violate the very laws that they claim to enforce. I, when I've confronted them with their violations of law, some have actually said to me, so sue me. Government bureaucrats know that most people cannot afford to initiate litigation, plus they, that they know that even when they were sued, it is the taxpayers who would pay to defend their law breaking, not them. You and I are expected to follow the law or pay the consequences. Bureaucrats are among the biggest violators of law precisely because they don't pay the consequences when they violate our supreme law, the Constitution, and the very laws that they claim to enforce. All the while, it is Martha and people like her who must incur tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees to deal with unlawful bureaucratic actions, only to have their means of earning a living shut down for fear of uncertain and unscrupulous enforcement. Unlike frivolous and unscrupulous actions by bureaucrats such as those that shut down Martha's farm, frivolous lawsuits against counties would be quickly dismissed. 
To avoid lawsuits, counties and their employees need to do one simple thing that is expected of all of us, and that is respect and follow the law that governs them. I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker today, Joel Salatin. He's a farmer and best-selling author. His farm uh, in Virginia services th some 3,000 families, which shows that farming is not just about growing crops, it's about the community, it's about commerce. His approach to farming has the precision of a scientist, the joy of a child, and the passion of a patriot. I'd like to uh, ask Joel Salatin to come step forward and say a few words. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, and it's an honor. I'm Joel Salatin, the co-owner of Polyface Farm near Stanton in the Shenandoah Valley. We own and lease about 1,500 acres and produce salad bar beef, pastured poultry, that's eggs, broilers, and turkeys, piggerator pork, forage-based rabbits, and lumber from our 450-acre forest, selling everything directly through our on-farm store and our own distribution network to some 6,000 families. That's an old uh, bio there. Uh, 6,000 families, 50 restaurants, and 10 retail outlets within four hours' drive of the farm. We don't ship anywhere uh, beyond that. My mom and dad purchased the farm in 1961, and we now have four generations living and working on the farm in addition to a 20-person staff. That's a lot of jobs for a little family farm. How is it done? Well, we're zoned agricultural, which means it's illegal for us to have a woodworking shop to turn our own trees into children's toys or furniture. It's illegal for us to process our own beef and pork. Indeed, calves born on our farm arm <clears throat> have to be exported from the county in order to sell a T-bone steak to a neighbor. We'd like to cure our hams, but not only can we not process the pork on the farm, we can't cure the ham because that's a manufactured product, illegal in agriculture zones. Some of our staff of full-time, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed young farmers want to live on the farm. We have lumber, garden space, why commute from town? But housing for them is illegal on agricultural land. I could go on in this vein at length, but I hope you get the picture. Almost everything I want to do is illegal. But these illegal activities are critical for farm viability. Anyone desiring to preserve farmland must first preserve farmers. Encouraging profitable farmers is the cornerstone of farmland preservation. Our current right to farm legislation only preserves the right of farmers to produce raw commodities at low margins to be value added by offset processors, off-site processors, marketers, and distributors. The result is a few gigantic farms and a fundamentally segregated food and farming system. And I know that's a powerful word, but I will use it again in purpose. How did we go from a historically normal integrated system, the kind that attracts millions to Colonial Williamsburg, to today's abnormal segregated system? The change occurred naturally as our culture moved from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy. With cheap fuel and transportation and a limited accounting system that did not measure resource depletion or pollution, agriculture followed the industrialized factory manufacturing model. The farm-sized industry of yesteryear gave way to mega Sized, smelly, not in my backyard, neighbor insulting factory producers and processors. The combination of repugnant factory farms and mega processing facilities stripped traditional farm value adding enterprises from the definition of farming. So the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker historically practicing their crafts proximate to animals and grain were summarily dismissed from their rural roots and relocated to mega processing facilities far away. In today's legislative and cultural lingo, farmers have been relegated to peasant status, producing only raw materials for the lords and barons of commerce, a feudal economy. Peasants can't have festivals, parties, recreation, education. Those activities can't occur near cows, plows, and sows. <laughs> 
Today, this factory food and farming paradigm is breaking up as surely and profoundly as gunpowder destroyed feudalism and the Gutenberg press fanned the Reformation. As democratization, micrositing, business transparency, and anti-fragility move through our culture, farmer entrepreneurs and savvy, connected consumers are creating a tsunami of integrated localization interest. From microbreweries to backyard commercial kitchens, neighbor-friendly, appropriately scaled integrity, and artisanal farm food businesses yearn to be fee free from a fundamentally segregationist mentality that farms are not hubs of economic activity but simply places to produce raw commodities for further processing elsewhere. HB 1430 emancipates entrepreneurial farmers like me from a segregationist enslavement and frees us to process beef near the field where the cows live, to make chairs near the forest where the trees grow, and to make quiche near where the chickens lay their eggs. HB 1430, and I'm almost done, is back to the future. That we even have to enact a law that allows the kind of rural economy exhibited only in living history museums like Williamsburg speaks to how far our culture has strayed from common sense. I beg that these shackles that bind our farm businesses that keep us from ministering to the food and fiber needs of our communities be unlocked. I expect opposition from two quarters. The first is the factory farming or industrial agriculture community that fears market competition from entrepreneurial farmers like me. Such opposition is, of course, selfish and myopic when you consider the greater good. The other quarter is the environmentalism by abandonment crowd, the radical earth muffins and preservationists who believe nature is too sacrosanct to foul with human breath. <laughs> These folks... Does the clapping take off my time? <laughs> these, these, folks would, as as these folks would rather see farms revert to wilderness areas for Bambi and Thumper. I guess, I guess they'll get their food from China's leftovers. I think participatory environmentalism is best. And populating our land with community sensitive, ecologically embedded, viable farm businesses is the best way to satisfy both the needs of the earth, the economy, and everybody. Everyone else, and that's most of us, should see the value of an HB 1430 as axiomatic, akin to assuming it would be a good thing if the sun rose tomorrow. So let's give ourselves some freedom to, in order to better enjoy tomorrow's sunrise. Thank you very much. I'm a lawyer, but I really want to be Joel Salatin. <laughs>